Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on immigration. This is such a fascinating and fast changing environment and so topical for so many of us and also for your clients. I'm really, really looking forward to this one, looking forward to discussing it with all of you. And I hope you get a lot of value out of your time with us today. I'm Jennifer Anderson from Innate, and today I'm joined by Natalie Williams Ashman from Immigration South Africa. Natalie, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Jennifer. Uh, before we get started, a quick note on CPD. Uh, details on CPD points will be confirmed after the session as usual. And always, um, we're very, very happy to take questions, and I'm sure there will be quite a few of them today. So if you have a question, please post it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer as many of them as we can at the end of the session. All right, Natalie, to kick us off, can you tell us a little bit about what your company does, what you specialize in, and what you help clients with? Super. Well, we're in a very fortunate position in terms of we deal with both immigration and immigration. So that's people coming into South Africa, as well as people who are exploring other options. So our main focus on the outward bound is the investment and the startup type um, entrepreneurial type visas, but we have a very, very different and very broad client base because we deal with both. So on the inbound um, thing, we deal with businesses bringing people in to do their work visas, as well as a big chunk um, of foreigners who are looking to choose South Africa as their home, um, either on a permanent or temporary basis, whether it be retirees, um, you know, people, students, people just looking to live a different life. And I mean, that's interesting for me, Natalie. I think the, the kind of talk around the bry on a Saturday night, certainly not that people are coming to South Africa. Uh, is that something that you're seeing a lot of? Uh, I think that would be quite surprising for a lot of us. So I think there's been such a significant shift since COVID. I think it really made people take stock of what was important to them. And we saw a massive uptick, um, particularly in people coming to the Western Cape, uh, mainly out of Europe, but even countries that we have traditionally have seen very few. So Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada, those kind of countries, we've also seen a big shift as people start choosing lifestyle. And I think the biggest driver for that is that we've seen this big delinking between where you employ and how you earn your income and where you choose to live. And I think that's been hugely beneficial um, from a South African perspective, because, we, you know, if you look at the awards we've won over the last couple of years, you know, we are still a very, very popular destination um, for a huge number of nationalities. And, you know, if you look at the kind of the, the financial data in terms of people that are investing in South Africa, particularly from a property perspective, the numbers are enormous and growing. So that, you know, they've always been big, but certainly from the Western Cape, when you look at the data, um, there's still significant, significant investment from abroad and that money isn't leaving. Um, so people are, are still investing in South Africa. And I think it's, you know, the, the drivers are so multifaceted because I think some of it is that, you know, kind of the draw of the lifestyle and the cost of living. Um, that South Africa has to offer, but also what we can see from a push perspective is the big shift in terms of a more conservative approach um, in a lot of particularly European countries. And, you know, we see similar shifts in the US, you know, where um, religious freedom, sexual orientation, all those kind of things, you know, you can't believe that in this day and age we're having these kind of conversations, but they become very, very topical. And a lot of people, that's why they are choosing South Africa and why they, a lot of them are also choosing to educate their children in South Africa in terms of a more liberal, open, um, broader education system. So, you know, and I think, you know, for people to just kind of keep a realistic view of why foreigners are choosing. You know, they've already got their EU passport or their American passport. So this is, they're choosing the life. Um, and I think that's, you know, very similarly to how South Africans who choose the plan B kind of options, who choose the lifestyle that comes with staying in South Africa, but they've got that backup plan of that alternative passport or residency. Yes, for sure. And I mean, I think that's probably a great opportunity for a whole lot of advisors on the call today. If these people coming from overseas need financial advice in South Africa, um, probably quite a niche market, I would think, and as you say, probably mostly in the Western Cape. Um, Natalie, if we talk yeah. about the other side of the coin now, so people who, as you say, are looking for a plan B or, uh, you know, maybe people want to send kids to, to university overseas or potentially actually bite the bullet and, and make a move to a different country. What are the kind of trends that you're seeing there uh, and sort of things that have changed in that environment? Because I know, you know, from talking to you up to now, these things can change so quickly. 
they certainly can. And I think, we, you know, if we look at it from two perspectives, so in terms of what the options are available has changed significantly, um, particularly in the investment-based stuff. You know, we saw the golden visa um, for Portugal has go through significant changes. Um, you know, the Irish program is officially closed and it closes to investors at the end of this year. So that kind of, those kind of changes and they're happening all the time. So it's very important for people who are considering these options to actually take action because, you know, the drivers change all the time and the rules change all the time. So if, you know, your client is considering these options for them not to sit on the fence for too long, because, you know, we see it with us with a lot of our clients, particularly around things like the EB-5 program for the U.S., where they kind of keep forgetting that they think they've got a lot of time and they forget that they've got to have applied before their child turns 21. You know, so a lot of people underestimate the time that it takes. And so I would strongly encourage people to take action if they are thinking about it, because there are always significant changes. Then in terms of the changes that we see from a, a personal perspective, particularly in the outbound space, is that people have settled down. Um, a year ago, people, we were seeing a lot of quite crazy behavior um, in terms of people making very major, very emotional decisions, and largely, I think, misinformed kind of decisions. And I think, you know, what a lot of the, you know, your audience might have seen is their clients actually not understanding the tax implications um, a lot of, around a lot of those decisions that they were making. We now we've seen people are taking the time, there's not this panic, there's not this urgency, and they are taking the time to become more and more informed about what their decisions mean. Mm. No, I think that's so true. And um, talk to us about that Portuguese visa, because, I mean, I certainly have uh, have friends who put away, I, I don't know how much you had to do to buy their little spot in Portugal. And then, uh, you know, the big hurdle was that you had to learn Portuguese, which is a very big hurdle for many of us, and uh, and pass a Portuguese exam. So is that now, is that no longer? Has that fallen away? So if, if the, in, the, in the current, you know, with the way, so the Golden Visa had multifacets to it, but because property kind of became the, that, you know, everybody knew the Golden Visa for the property option. And essentially where, why it was closed down was due to opposition within Portugal, because all it did was actually push property prices through the roof. So as you say, the property, it wasn't the value of the property, it was the price of the Golden Visa, and that drove the price of, price of property through the roof. So that part of the program has been closed down. And instead, they've taken stock and they've gone, okay, so this has proven to be hugely popular all over the world and is a huge um, encouragement of investment. And they're going, okay, so how do we change this to make sure that Portugal really benefits? So they've done one of two things. One is they're very focused on the startup kind of visa space. And they're going, well, if you're a proven entrepreneur, we would really like you to come in first. The first stage is to test your business concept through one of our research and development facilities. And then if your concept is, you know, by the time you've gone through your incubation period, if it's a feasible thing, we would love you to launch your startup from Portugal. And then the second part, from the, which is more kind of, it's not a new part, but it's always been the part of the Golden Visa, but people didn't really focus on it, was the actual investment. So instead of investing in property, you've actually got to put it in a financial instrument. So it's still, so it's some of them can be, you know, it can be a Portuguese regulated fund, it can be a private equity fund, um, but that, you know, from a South African perspective, you know, it wasn't a hugely popular option. Um, and, you know, where the kind of startup visas are far more financially accessible thing for the right kind of client, um, but both yeah. options would give them the same flexibility. But sadly, that Portuguese exam is still very much a requirement, and I can't see that going anywhere. Um, so people need to be realistic about that. And, you know, if they're happy staying in the residency space, that can also work, you know. So I think it's, you know, for people just to be realistic and kind of just take stock think it through, do their homework, make sure they're investing in the right kind of thing. Because sadly, I think for the, the investors who invested in property, they're unlikely to ever recover their investment um, to the same value, purely because I think property prices are going to actually normalize to what the mm. property was actually worth to start with, rather than the golden visa price. Oh my goodness. Uh, I, could, I can't imagine the stress. Uh, and Natalie, now mm. tell us a little bit um, about how to uh, buy your way into the US. I can't say it any other way. I know that's something that you you specialize in. Um, tell us how that works. So the EB-5 program has been hugely popular among the South African uh, market. 
purely because it is it's, it's stock standard. And if you actually invest in the right project, you're going to get your money back, plus you're going to get your green cards. But it's all about investing in the right project. So there were a lot of shifts that the investment value was at, at 500,000 US dollars for years and years and years. It's now been increased with a minimum of 800,000 going up to 1.2, depending on where your project is that you're investing in and how the rules work around creating employment drivers. So it, why it's such a popular um, in, option among my clients is because it gets their children in with that green card. So essentially, from that investment, you are, um, you know, in no way are you restricted. So you've got a, a full green card. So as much as, it, you know, the first green card is a conditional green card, the only condition on that is that it's valid for two years. And in that two years, your project has got to prove that they've created the required jobs. But there in no way does it restrict what you do. So you can live anywhere. You can work for anybody. You can start your own business. You can retire. Your children can study as local um, citizens, even though you're only a resident at that stage. And then for a lot of people, that route to U.S. citizenship is very, very important. But I think, you know, what is very, very different from a lot of the other kind of drivers and how the programs work is if you're investing in the right project, you're actually going to get paid out as opposed to, you know, having to sell a property and deal with the fluctuations. So you, if you invest in the right project, you will get your investment back. But I think it's very important that people take time to understand what project you're dealing with. Because essentially there are two risks we need to be able to mitigate. One is the investment risk that you are going to get your money back. And the second is the immigration risk. So from an investment risk perspective, it's very important that your clients understand the financial buildup of the project. So all these projects, you want to look for projects that are already fully financed, that don't need your EB5 money, that are only doing it because it's cheap access to finance as opposed to borrowing from the bank. So that would be always be my first point, question. Is the project already fully financed? The second one is what is the track record of the developers? Because unfortunately, um, the US, and if you just need to Google, is littered with incomplete um, EB5 projects. And it, you know, this, you know, it, certainly COVID didn't help that situation. So it's very important that they look at kind of the track record of the developer, not just as a developer, but particularly in this EB5 space and go, okay, so what is it? How many applicants have they taken through the process? How many investors have they repaid? All that kind of information. And then from, a, from the immigration risk, because the risk is you've got to create those jobs. And so, you know, so from a project perspective, there needs to be some kind of guarantee in place that the project will be completed no matter what. So, you know, those are the kind of things that I think people really need to take their time and think about so that they do achieve their outcome. They do get their green cards. They do ultimately end up with US citizenship, but they also end up with the investment back. Hmm. Yeah, very important. I don't think anybody wants to see 800,000 US dollars walking out the door for good. Um, and tell us now about getting into the US via the job route. So I think we've all seen those green card lottery adverts that pop up all over <laughs> on, on the internet. Uh, is that the way in? Uh, we've all heard it's not as much of a, a kind of lucky draw lottery as uh, as it sounds. How does that process work? And is that a viable way to get yourself into the US? So let's focus first on the word lottery. Um, so it, it is in. A, is it a? Can you? Is it a planned, um, executable plan? No, not really. Can you get lucky? Absolutely. How lucky is very dependent on your skills, not what where you are in the queue. So they never say it, but you know we see a particular shift. The kind of people who aren't getting it happen to be the skills that they short on. So I've got one client, he's a pilot. Oh, funny that, um, how he suddenly, you know, got in that he's been entering for years and years and years. And as they're having this pilot shortage, he suddenly gets it. So absolutely, it does happen. Is it a plan? Mm, I, I think it's more of a luck of the draw, but it is not as random as um, people think. And I think if they kind of apply common sense and go, well, if, you know, in terms of my occupation, my experience, I'm like everybody else in the US, my chance is far diminished. However, if I happen to have a skill that's currently in shortage in the US, there is a small chance, but it is a small chance. 
and but there's no harm you know that nothing it certainly is a legitimate program which i think is a lot of um people's concerns it is a real program it does it, it does have um legs but it's certainly not a, a guaranteed plan for anybody and is it a transparent process? So, you know, for certain countries, so I know for Australia, for example, they've got published lists about how many they need of each skill set. And then every time they do a draw, they, they, you know, they publish who they picked and how many points those people had. Is the US like that as well? Or is it just smoke screens everywhere? Absolutely not. <laughs> so the US immigration share very, very little information. Um, even within, um, you know, among the immigration attorneys in the US. So it's very much a black hole. And um, everything is, I think, you know, they keep the kind of um, evaluation things um, private purely because it allows them to maneuver according to what they um, need and what they want without having to make policy changes. So, you know, when you read the legislation, it's always very, very loose. And, um, and with the US, they open and close things at a moment's notice. So, you know, I know there are a lot of South Africans who are currently going as tractor drivers or um, farming specialists and um, those kind of things because there's a need at the moment. But you've mm. always got to remember that that door closes when the, there's no longer the need and how long that need is, is there for. Um, and people just need to be aware of particularly, I think it's particularly bad in the US, but you know, the, the, you know, the, the Irish program was also a key, uh, indicator, you know, Portugal was another one of how quickly the legislation can change. And if you are mid process, depending on what that legislative change, it might leave your hand dry or you might be able to continue with the process. But I think particularly when it comes to the US, people must remember that a short-term work visa is in no way lining you up for a long-term plan there. So you know, particularly when it comes to South African families, people need to just kind of take a moment and think and really be realistic and go, okay, so if my, my visa is only valid for a season, is it really mm. worth uprooting my whole family, move taking my kids out of school when you know they, they, I probably won't be able to continue in this path? And I think that's a big misconception in South African terms. And you know, I think we are fairly risk taking, um, and we are. I like to think that the rules can be bent, but you know, I get calls all the time of South Africans who've gone to the US, particularly. Um, and think that there was going to be some kind of plan when there actually wasn't. It, you know, the, everything in immigration is driven by the need of the country. They aren't concerned about, you know, you and, and what your objectives are. It's got, mm -hmm. what is the need? Why do we need you in our country, not the other way around? And I think people need to be realistic about that. Yes, most definitely. And can you imagine now having to pack up and come back? Um, probably the only thing more stressful than having to pack up and move in the first place. Um, and if we talk about other options, so obviously, you know, the UK is quite popular in terms of people trying to get in uh, from a job-based perspective, Australia, New Zealand, Canada to an extent. Uh, what's the kind of status quo with those processes and those visas? How easy is it to, to go that route? And, and kind of what's your advice for everybody that's that's on the webinar with us today? I think the, the kind of two very important things that South Africans need to understand. Number one, there's a difference between qualification and skills. And the world has moved significantly into that skill space. So as much as, you know, our generation, we all had broad general degrees. But I think, you know, when you start thinking particularly around your children, it is a skills-driven world going forward. Um, no matter where you are, people aren't interested anymore in terms of this way, you know, this broad thinking generalist view. There are millions of us around the world with that kind of background and they're going, okay, so what can you do where you can arrive today and be working and adding value tomorrow? And that goes from an immigration as well as an employment-based thing. Because And for people to really take stock and think that through, particularly when they, they're going with their, um, talk, thinking about their children and all that kind of thing, and for them to really understand what that means. And those lists, once again, change all the time. So what the, you know, we've seen huge shifts in the last few years. Um, it's anyone's guess what the impact of AI is going to be on those time skills. Um, you know, because I think that is something that I think we're all trying to anticipate um, more and more and more. But also from a, a kind of 
thinking differently is for people to also realize that, the, as I mentioned earlier, that the link between job and where you live doesn't have to be one in the same. Where some a lot of the programs are very prescriptive still. So a lot of the, the job related things, particularly for New Zealand, Australia and Canada are very prescriptive in terms of where you live and who you work for. So, you know, you don't always have, um, you know, as much as you might have a skill that is needed, but where your skills are needed might be in the middle of, you know, far northern Canada, where it's freezing and you never see the daylight. So I think for mm. people to really get that and understand, you know, the difference of what, what the trade-offs are and when they're going, okay, so I've got a highly desirable skill. Do I need to be in a country where it's linked to my job or am I actually able to work from anywhere and where would I choose to live? And I think that choosing to live is such an important thing for people to understand where I get calls all the time of people adamant that they're going to a place they've never been to, which I, I cannot understand. I that, you know, you yeah. can uproot your whole family, your whole life, everything you know, and go to a place you've never been to. And I think, you know, for South Africans, you know, you look at that, that flight, those costs of flights, it's very negligible in terms of what it's actually going to cost you to move. So, to, you know, spend the 50 or 60,000 rand, get on a plane, go and look, be realistic and, you know, and be realistic about who you are and who your family is. You know, the, what works for your brother-in-law and sister-in-law and your friends that you've known your whole life may not work for your family. And to rather do that whole exercise before you've uprooted and really, and it's, you know, and I think for people to understand that, you know, we kind of go back once again to kind of where, you know, what risks we're trying to mitigate in the space to really focus on what they're trying to do. So are they just trying to actually, you know, are they in a position where they're struggling to find a job in South Africa? Is the right option to be immigrating? Is the right option to try and work remotely? And likewise, you know, for people who are, you know, looking to secure their children's future in another, in another country, is this the right mechanism to be able to do that? Um, and people just to be realistic around that. Yeah, no, most definitely. And I see lots of thumbs up and claps there. Um, I read actually an article came out today from, from Sable Wealth about immigration. So it was great timing for our webinar today. And they talked about how when you're in fight or flight mode, uh, emotions almost ruling your your decisions and you aren't necessarily thinking clearly. And they use that analogy with regards to immigration, which I found really, really interesting. Um, and that's exactly what you don't want to do, uh, listening to, to all of your advice to us today. But, and the thing is, I think that we're, you know, we've got to separate the emotion out of it, particularly because I think whether you're looking at an investment-based option or a job-related thing, there are significant financial implications. And when you, you take all that kind of flight and flight emotion out of it, um, you know, people make far more sensible financial decisions. And I think this is where your audience can add so much value to their clients, is helping them dissect what they're really trying to achieve. And, you know, if they're looking to diversify and particularly, you know, even for, you know, people who are choosing to go and to take stock and go, well, am I actually going to throw, take everything with me? Or am I actually going to take stock and go, okay, I'm going to let me get there first and see how it all pans out. I'm not going to sell my house. I'm not going to try and liquidate every single investment I've got. I'm not going to try and withdraw every cent I can possibly out of my investments. I'm going to actually just take stock. I'm going to think about what the, the mix of my portfolio is and how much international exposure um, I've got within my existing portfolio and how I can jig that to achieve the same objective without making crazy decisions. And I, once again, I must just reiterate time and time again, for people to understand the tax implications. And, you know, what we, you know, and it's always by the time people realize that there's a tax implication, they've already done it. So it's too late to, to roll back. And similarly, you know, we I see a very, a very similar picture playing out for particularly countries like um, the UK where people underestimate the cost of living. And so they had a, they had a family home somewhere in South Africa, they sold it, they've taken that capital. 
And because, you know, the cost of living is so high and the cost of childcare is so high, um, we're seeing a lot of those kind of what we're, what we're dual income houses. It's now not viable for both parents to work. And so a lot of women are coming out of the workforce and are forced, purely because of the economics, um, not to be working. And they're saying with the cost of living, they cannot afford to live on one person's salary. And then they're slowly, slowly eating in their cap into their capital. Where we've got other clients who, you know, kept their property in South Africa, put a tenant in, and they've, you know, that, that little bit of extra income has been an absolute lifesaver. Um, for them in terms of making sure that they could actually just prop up, you know, their income without actually having to eat into their capital um, and they, they've still got an asset. Because I think that a lot of South Africans also don't understand the cost of entry into the property market elsewhere in the world um, is unachievable for many. Yes. No, I think that's so true. And, I mean, interesting that you mentioned the cost of childcare and you know, potentially one one person in the household, you know, having to actually stay home when they used to work. And I mean, the kind of change to the dynamic of your family and your relationship with your partner when something like that happens must be significant as well. And I mean, I know you and I have talked about how you shouldn't underestimate that in the move either, um, that, that if a change like that's going to happen, you know, go in with your eyes open uh, and and be aware of the sacrifices that you're going to make. Exactly. And I think, you know, the, the, from a woman's perspective, I think that's where people really don't often really understand the implications of what they mean. You know, we're in the, South Africa, you know, I see so many of my clients where they've had their own jobs and with their own jobs have come their own income and their own priorities and their own space and their own identity. And suddenly you need to be somewhere where halfway across the world where you're suddenly staring at your children 24 hours a day everything has to be thought of in terms of you don't know where the doctor is, where the dentist is, where to buy school shoes, you know, the most practical things, and you've lost your support system. And, you know, so I certainly know what the implications would be on my marriage if I suddenly didn't, you know, we were down to a single income and I was having to rely on my husband 100% financially in terms of the dynamic of that. And if you, mm -hmm. you know, so that so many marriages... Um, fail during that stage because, and not because I think they needed to, but because they didn't really understand jointly what the impact would be and think that through. And then it kind of drives, okay, so why are we doing this and are we going to the right place? And I think, you know, that it's a lot of it, you know, particularly around, say, countries like Australia um, and the UK that are so expensive. People look at that initial salary number and they go, oh, Bonus. We're going to live like kings. Meanwhile, um, they don't really understand. Um, and, and I think particularly from South Africans, and I think particularly in our generation, where a lot of us spend quite a lot of time in the UK, and we think we understand how it works, you know, from uh, the days of working holiday visas, it's a very different place. And the cost of living relative to what we know, you know, gone are the days where whole houses are seen to have central heating, and you jump on the tube to go anywhere, um, you know, the, the costs are enormous and people's salaries certainly aren't offsetting that. Um, and for people just to be informed, be, you know, yes. for a lot of people, it's a great option, but just make sure that it's a great option for your family and you understand the implications of all of it. And once again, that you take time as a family to discuss how it's going to affect you. So in terms of how the schooling system, you know, so for a lot of families, you know, they end up living in quite expensive areas because of the schools linked to those areas. And yes. I think those kind of, you know, dynamics, once again, you know, they look at the, the whole thing of NHS, for example, and they don't understand, you know, the NHS isn't also what it used to be. You know, they're really struggling um, since COVID. They haven't, re you know, they're having endless strikes you know, getting in to see a doctor has become very, very difficult when you've got a sick child. Um, you know, just to be realistic and to go in with your eyes open and understand why you're making the choice. Yes. No, I think it's so important. And I believe there are also countries that target retirees. So once you've retired, come live, come spend your life, uh, you know, your golden years in our country. Is that really a thing? I think that's so interesting. 
I, it's, I think it's going to become a, a bigger and bigger thing. So if you look at the stats of how old people are getting, so, you know, people's retired years can easily equal their working years. You know, as I mentioned, yeah, my grand is about to turn 102 um, next week. Okay. And if you look at, you know, the, the, if you, you know, the, the BBC had a very interesting article um, around, you know, the, this aging population, you know, and the projections are, you know, certainly it, it's not going to become, it's, it's already becoming the norm. So, you know, the, our, our generation, then our children's generation, everyone's going to live a long time. So I think this is the kind of category that our people are going to target increasingly. So the, the most notable one um, from a South African perspective is Mauritius. So, our, you know, their economy was annihilated with COVID and they really had to go back to the drawing board and go, okay, so how are we going to get people back into our country and how can we keep them here on more than just a kind of a tourism type basis where they're going to come in and they've actively targeted retirees from all over the world and I think this is a really exciting opportunity for South Africa um, mm -hmm. and because you know we've, we've certainly got the interest and from a retiree perspective both in terms of our cost of living our quality of life the quality of healthcare, all those kind of things and I think we're going to see more and more um, kind of countries who are, have a lifestyle um, option. And if you look at, you know, that from certainly from a European perspective, where people have a, a fixed income and, you know, the, and a growing expense base, you know, these perceived cheaper locations where they can live off their pension with a far better quality of life, um, I think it's, it's hugely beneficial. And, you know, it's certainly from a South African perspective, that Mauritius appeal, same time zone, great weather. Mm -hmm. You can still, you know, as much as their healthcare does cater for pretty much everything these days, if you still want to go to your own cardiologist, it's a quick plane trip here. You spend a week here, you go to the dentist the, the, and, you know, <laughs> cover all that off. Um, you know, your family can come and visit. You know, it, it really is a great um, lifestyle choice for um, a lot of, and it, funny enough, it's a, a huge draw. I think most of my clients in that space kind of coming out of Durban, where, you know, they love that Durban climate, but they just want a slightly slower pace, um, more predictable kind of day to day. So to exciting space, to watch. I, I certainly think it's going to be one that's going to grow as our population ages. Uh, and if we turn to the financial aspect now of, of this whole process, and you've mentioned before people have to be careful, they have to be careful about their tax. Uh, I certainly feel like there's a perception that when you when you make the move and you leave the country, people feel like I must cut my ties and I'm going to take absolutely everything that I can because I'm kind of done and I'm out. Uh, is that the advice that that you would give to your clients when they make that move? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest thing, people, if you look globally, everyone is looking for global exposure. And where your money sits and what it's invested in is a far more relevant picture than taking everything out of the country. And, you know, this is, you know, there are some very clever people that this is what they do in terms of understanding the tax implications, because, it, you know, it, and it's very important from all aspects, because as soon as you, you know, if you are in that plan B space, as soon as you then become a tax resident there, what those implications are. Um, the, the same thing where, you know, where a lot of the plan Bs, because you're not a resident there, there aren't any tax implications. But as soon as you start moving money between, and you know, the, and the same applies in terms of children. So you know, you've suddenly, you know, say for example, a family that have gone with the Irish program, and you know, they, they've invested their money; it's sitting in that fund in in Ireland. But their children that have are now starting their five years of residency. They actually want to buy them, you know, help their child buy property in Ireland, and understanding the tax implications of those kind of decisions. Um, but I certainly don't think people should rush um, and, you know, throw all caution to the wind. Go to the country you're going, settle down, understand the property market, understand what the investment strategy is, understand how much liquidity you're going to need, understand where you can get the best from an interest rate perspective, you know, and then take stock and go, speak to your financial advisor and go, okay, so what's my real mix of my portfolio in terms of what I'm trying to achieve from a global exposure perspective, how you know how can I manage my risk? Because let's face it, um, you know you just need to open today's news to understand you know 
investment anywhere. It is, there's nowhere where it's a safe bet in terms of from a financial markets perspective. You know, there's so many elements at play. And this big thing of the South African government stealing your money, <laughs> I think it means people need to move beyond that because it doesn't drive the right investor behavior. It needs to be absolutely do you know that your money make the but make informed decisions based on the whole picture, not a knee-jerk reaction, and understand what you're going to get on the other side. And particularly in the kind of savings, retirement, pension type things. And you know, you're not playing in the short game. Look at the long-term term growth. Um, and I think that if we can just stop people thinking short term. Because, it, you know, particularly in a new place, you'll gobble through your capital at a rate of knots. And, you know, if that thing turns out to be the wrong decision for your family and you choose to come back, sadly, there are many, many South Africans who come home with nothing and have to really start from the bottom up again, purely because they just haven't been able to look um, on their earnings elsewhere in the world. Yes. And, I mean, it's much easier now to leave money behind. So if we think there's been a lot of change in this space in the last few years, so this concept of financial immigration has fallen away. If you leave the country, you can now carry on holding investments here. You can have your normal bank account here. You don't need some funny block brand account. Um, And you still have access to to take your money out. So if you haven't done a tax exit, you can still do your one one million rand discretionary allowance here and the 10 million rand um, special allowance. If you have done your tax exit, you've still got the 10 million rand special allowance with a a tax directive process available every year. So you don't have to knee jerk anymore, uh, which I think is fantastic. Um, And I think in the retirement space, there's obviously been significant change here as well, as you'll know. So, um, you know, the retirement uh, industry used to rely on that financial immigration process to allow you to take your money as an immigration event before retirement. And when that fell away, they needed a new rule and they came up with this three-year rule. So you have to become a non-SA tax resident, which means SARS does get a bite of, of the cherry before you leave, unfortunately, not from your retirement savings, but from your discretionary holdings. But then once you've been a non-tax resident for three years, you can then, if you choose to, withdraw those retirement savings and and take them to the country that you've moved to. So I think that speaks nicely to your kind of don't rush it um, advice because I think that, that three years should give you time to see who there to stay. Yeah. And the thing is that, you know, it, it's, it's it, as bizarre as it sounds, you know, when people were coming out of COVID and feeling the financial pressure, that became a driver. To be able to, they were, you know, the number of people that contacted me as they, it suddenly seemed to be kind of this um, little word on the street that, that, you know, that's how you could access your, your pension savings by by immigrating. And, it, you know, so I, I think it's a very, very positive change in terms of just once again, taking that emotion out, giving time, people time to take stock, really understand what they're trying to achieve. And, you know, just one other point that I think financial advisors need to also understand is around, um, you know, wills and multinational things in terms of where the Mm -hmm. investment sits and when, you know, the person dies, how that plays out from a tax perspective. Um, I think it's a huge value add that a lot of the advisors can look at their clients and go, okay, so if you've got this very global portfolio um, in terms of how the will works and how all that kind of thing in terms of moving money out of South Africa or into South Africa, you know, and what the most cost effective from a tax perspective is on both sides. Because I think that's what people often don't understand is, you know, there are going to be tax implications on, you know, so if it's a property in Europe, what the tax implications are when that property gets sold. And, you know, likewise on the, the South African side, and really to think that through, um, ahead of time because I think a lot of people aren't really understanding that and also to understand that changes all the time so every couple of years to go back and kind of reflect and go well is this still the most sensible plan um, that I can put in place for you know my my family planning yes and I think as you mentioned a few times tax tax is important here so uh, just for everyone on the call I'm sure many of our advisors are are well versed in this but when you do a, a tax exit from South Africa, so you apply to be a non-SA uh, tax resident, 
what will happen is that on the day that you, let's say you left the country on the 1st of April, uh, and that's the day you're declaring your non-tax residency, what SARS will do is they'll take all the discretionary assets that you own at that date, and they will essentially um, almost assume that you've done a deemed disposal. So from a capital gains perspective, they'll assume you sold everything on that date and they're going to charge you capital gains. And they're doing that because that's sort of their last bite of the cherry, um, because from then on, you should be taxed in, in the country that you're now a tax resident of. So I know certainly quite a few people I've spoken to have this misnomer in their mind that SARS kind of charges you something extra when you leave, like a last kind of, we're going to really have a, a go at you on the way out. But it's, I mean, it is a tax and it has to be taken into account, but it's not something extra um, you do get kind of get to to rebase those assets and that capital. So I think that's something that that's one of those those myths that we talk about uh, with our friends uh, on a Saturday night. Uh, and then from a retirement perspective, this is where I think people must be very careful. And you've mentioned that before, Natalie, is that if you do decide if you've immigrated and you've done your, your SA tax exit and you do decide to take your retirement savings with you, so the money out of your preservation funds, retirement annuities, and, and your pension and provident funds, you will be taxed on that, and you're going to be taxed according to the pre-retirement tax tables that SARS has in place. So it's not the normal tax tables for income, it's these retirement, pre-retirement tax tables, and they are not particularly friendly to lump sums. So it quite quickly ramps up to a 30% tax rate, and it's over your lifetime. So you can't say, well, I'll trickle it out, I'll take, you know, half a million this year, half a million next year. They add it up and they look at all of it. So you could literally on a, you know, a 5 million rand retirement savings, you know, buckets that you've built up over your entire working life, you could pay 2 million rand tax kind of thing, one and a half to 2 million rand tax. So it's, it's a really big chunk. Uh, and I think often people take it from a place of emotion um, particularly with Regulation 28 in place, I think that strengthens this narrative of the government's going to take my money, the government's going to force me to buy ESCOM or, or something like that. But, you know, think carefully, I suppose, would be both our messages, Natalie, from you and I, um, before you, you do that, understand the tax implications and how long it's going to take for your money to catch up um, and, and how close you are to retirement. If you can hang on uh, and rather take a living annuity where you get a regular income that's that probably will actually be taxed in the country you're now living in. Um, you could save a significant amount of tax. There is some admin that comes with that and some complexity, but potentially a big saving. Absolutely. And I think, you know, to keep people focused on the long game. So don't make short-term um, knee-jerk reactions. Your, your pension is a long game. And to understand what that really means, and there are loads of clever people that could help your clients project forward um, in terms of, and once again, look at the makeup of, of that and to kind of project it forward, understand that you know, there is a currency risk if you're then drawing it into a different currency, but in terms of the kind of interest we can still, we still get, um, in South Africa and the global growth, because I think it, you know, as much as that, you know, we look at all the economic indicators and that kind of thing. If you are focused on kind of, okay, but so you know, for people who are now in their forties, realistically, they're going to make it with a, conservatively until eighty or ninety. What, where's the world going to be from an investment perspective over that time? And I think you know, a lot of the things that I see, and I think it's a huge benefit in terms of my exposure to the European markets where the European kind of investors are going, okay, there's no, there's no market. You know, Europe is such an aging market. And to kind of go with, where the opportunities, where is the growth going to be? And they, a lot of them are, are strange enough investing in kind of the emerging markets because of our young population. And they go, okay, so you, you know, we're compared to, you know, if you look at what the Japanese aging population is, Belgium, Germany, you know, everyone's getting older, no one's coming into the workforce, no one's having children. And so where are the opportunities? And I think for people to understand, there's so many variables that come with this. So don't use one crazy emotion um, to drive crazy behavior. Yes, spot on. And, and I mean, I think if we just think about price parity, so I would I would be worried about, well, now I'm I'm spending in pounds, but my retirement savings are in rands. Surely that means by the time I retire, my rands are going to be worth a peanut in the UK. Uh, I did check in with our clever friends at Innate Invest, and the kind of general sense is that over time, that price parity and the, the inflation differentials between the country will keep the kind of price of a Big Mac, if we could use that term, 
um, fairly similar in terms of buying power between the two countries over a long period of time. Um, there was a caution about currency risk, which you mentioned, and that's really a sequence risk thing. So if you're planning on retiring and then taking everything on one day, that's probably extremely risky. Who knows what's going to happen with the currency on that day? You could choose a really, really bad day um, just, just by bad luck. Um, so I think that currency risk is real. Um, but, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is to defer tax as long as you can. So I, I do think it's something that people don't consider at all when they immigrate, typically, and advisors can add so much value just in, in calming the waters and, and showing people the impact of their decisions. And I think it's just also changing the narrative with their clients. So, you know, in terms of when we were all younger, you know, a lot of us worked elsewhere in the world. We didn't immigrate. And I think, and it's the same, you know, I see from people coming into South Africa, they're not immigrating to South Africa. They're choosing to live here. And that is, it has such a different emotional response and it doesn't have the finality. And to go, if people start talking about, we're going to go and work, live and work in the UK for a few years and see how it works out. And to get people into that space and get away from this obsession with this word immigration, because it does drive all kinds of bizarre behavior in terms of how people stop thinking and they just it's a it's a predetermined end rather than kind of evaluating as we go along and if you you know you look at where the global market is and i, I hope it, it, at the younger generation will understand that it's not so much about immigrating it's around securing global mobility so that you whoever you are are able to access the opportunities anywhere in the world as they come up and without this kind of cut and dry kind of mentality that seems to be playing out um and it's very much a south african thing you know when i talk to you know my german or english clients here you know they they've saw you know in terms of south africa is the only place they own property you know they don't own property in the, the uk you know they they're choosing to live here but they haven't immigrated to south africa they just choose mm -hmm. to live here and you know, and a lot of it, and it plays out across all different age groups. You know that I've got, um, you know, the, the shift since COVID. But I've seen a lot more families coming to South Africa, and once again, they just seeing it. Whether it's their five year, their ten year, their twenty, their all year plan, but they don't get obsessed with this term immigration. And yes. they, you know, and if we can start thinking more, far more along the the things of global mobility and those kind of things. I think it will drive far better decision making um, from a financial perspective um, within our, our South African market. Yeah, totally agree. I see lots of thumbs up and hearts. So I think uh, we, we're preaching to the converted today. Uh, one last question for me, and then I'm going to go and check our Q&A. Uh, and that's something that I think a lot of people consider. And that's what are, if I immigrate, can I take my elderly mom or dad with me? Um, you know, it's hard to break up a generation. People don't want to leave. Uh, you know, moms and dads and grannies and grandpas behind. How much do you see that happening? How realistic is it to think that you can do that? And what are the risks to look out for there? I think it's very multifaceted. So it's very country specific. And it's very dependent on what your status as a primary applicant is in that country. So for example, at Grenada, were you a full citizen? You know, it's very easy to add your, your parents on both sides onto that application, and they too become Grenadian citizens, where there are others that are, you know, sort of around family reunification, which is a more complicated process, and it's all the devil's in the details. So each country is different in terms of what age they need to be, their general health, um, you know, what your status is, your economic status within the country, all those kind of things, and similarly it applies to your children in terms of their age. So people need to kind of look the whole way along the, the, the spectrum. But I must mm. say to people, and time and time again, to really have the conversation again, because immigration is hard for everybody, but it's particularly hard for elderly people. And to, as much as leaving their family behind, I think it once again plays into this whole immigration finality kind of thing. And to have the conversation of saying, and it, I think it can drive far better behavior if they kind of look at it in terms of what the overall objective is. So if they just want their, their, um, their parents to have the same benefit as them, that can certainly be achieved for you know a slight 
to add on to the investment, um, but and to really have the conversation around what your parents want as well. And mm -hmm. the thing is, the financial aspect of that is very significant. So each country has very different rules, particularly around healthcare. And mm -hmm. I um, must say, you know, people really need to understand what this means. So a lot of elderly people will never qualify for healthcare in the country that you want. And the implications of that, as well as the implications of things like carers. So we spoke earlier about the cost of, of childcare. If you add on what the cost of, of old age caring elsewhere in the world, you know, it can also be financial suicide for a lot of people. And to kind of go, okay, so why are we doing this? Do my parents really want to come? And is this our long-term thing? Very much a similar kind of thing in terms of, are you moving as a family or is it a short-term work opportunity? And to look at that in that kind of thing and go, but my first suggestion would be get there, understand what your life is like and be able to speak realistically to them about what their life would be as opposed to a theoretical decision that then, you know, you've relocated, you've uprooted everybody and now the pressure to make it work becomes insurmountable for everybody where you're trying to make your children happy, you're trying to make your parents happy and you're trying to work it out. And for a lot of families, it's just too much pressure. Get there, take stock. And for most countries, there are options for elderly people, but be very sure that you understand the financial implications of that. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's that's absolutely spot on. Thanks, Natalie. All right, I'm going to get to some of our questions. We'll answer as many of them as we can. Um, so first question is about the EB-5 process from Robin. Thanks, Robin. And he says, are there restrictions for certain nationals? What an interesting question, especially with Trump running around the country um, with all this Islamophobia floating around. Is Are there restrictions? Uh, and are they yeah. opaque or are they uh, clearly stated? They're very process? clearly stated. So it's, it's nationalities like Iranians, um, Afghanistanis, all those kind of blacklisted countries. There are no restrictions in terms of South Africans all kind of the general makeup that we would see and primarily around your, your client base. So the, the Russian sector changes all the time. One minute they're on, one minute they're off. So that list always changes, but there are definitely nationalities that are barred. And just while we're talking about the EB-5 process for the US, the due diligence is so strict. So it is people need to understand that it is a real legitimate process where they want to know exactly where your money comes from. So for example, if you are deriving your $800,000 from the sale of a property, they want to know how you originally bought that property, you know, where you originally got the money. Um, so it's a very, very strict process and for good reason. You know, I think it's this kind of misconception of everyone gets in. Absolutely not. It's a very strict process, but for South Africans with their act together, so, you know, that you need to be able to prove where your money came from. So, you know, any informal kind of businesses where things haven't gone through SARS, um, all those kind of things can be very problematic, but absolutely that list shifts all the time and there are nationalities that are um, precluded from that. Hmm. Very interesting, good question. Thanks, Robin. Um, I see Andrew asked a question. I can potentially have a, a go at this one and Natalie, um, you're very welcome to, to add in as well. The question is, why bother with official financial immigration if your net value is, say, 5 million rand? So I think the first bit we've covered already, the, the concept of financial immigration has fallen away. There's now just a tax exit. Um, and I think there, there are very real reasons that one would want to do a tax exit. We've spoken about one of them, which is that it gives you access to your retirement savings if you're looking to do that. That's the only way to get access if you haven't, you know, if you've don't have any other withdrawal options left on those those options. Um, the other thing is, if you don't do a tax exit, you remain tax resident in both the country you're living in and in South Africa. And that can have very big implications. Uh, at the very least, if there's double taxation agreements in place, it can be a massive hassle. You're still doing tax uh, returns in both countries. You've got to offset what you've paid in this country with what you owe in that country. Um, that's the least of it. Uh, and if there aren't double taxation agreements, then you actually might be taxed twice um, because both South Africa and quite a few other countries work on a um, 
a residency-based tax system, which means where you are tax resident, you owe tax on your worldwide assets. Um, so, for example, I know Australia works like that as well. So you could literally be taxed twice if there's no double taxation agreement between those countries. So I also think it depends on how long you're going to be gone for all these things that Natalie's spoken about. But certainly if the long term plan is that you're going to be earning money and uh, earning investment income, et cetera, in the other country and not in South Africa, I definitely think you should chat to a tax practitioner uh, and see if if that tax exit, tax immigration is, is what you need to do. Natalie, do you agree with that? 100%. And that's the thing is get the right information at the beginning, not when you've already incurred a problem and take your time. You know, if it's if it's one year where you are potentially a, a greater tax liability, but take your time, understand, be sure that you, you understand what the, the way forward is for you um, and that you aren't going to end up taking the money out and then bringing it back in um, kind of 18 months later. Yes. No, I think very true. Um, okay, we've probably got time for one more question. I'm going to pick one about Mauritius um, from Renal. Thanks for the question. And the question is, are there a lot of terms and conditions to immigrate, especially if you are 65 plus? And Natalie, when you answer this, can you maybe talk to us about are you a resident or are you a citizen? Because obviously, it's one thing to stay there. It's another thing to have the passport. And I know you touched on that with me when we were chatting about Mauritius earlier. It's such an important difference. So for Mauritius is purely a residency program. So you're never getting a Mauritian passport. What it is, is allowing you to live there for as long as you meet the requirements. So initially, you know, they've, that's one of the significant changes they've made since COVID. They now kind of go, the, the renewal cycle is far more spread out. So you will eventually end up to the point where you're only renewing every 10 years, assuming that you still meet the requirements. But because it's residency, you've got to understand that the rules can change all the time, and they do. So sometimes it's it's of benefit. Um, but as soon you know, at least you know, if you look at the global trends, temporary residency is exactly that. You are a temporary resident, as in that they see you only there for as long as your visa is is valid. Permanent residency is that. They see you there as a permanent citizen and with that comes different things, but you are still not a citizen. And so people really, and I think it was a huge misconception um, around, you know, when Mauritius first started introducing their residency program, that it was a citizenship program. It never is, and I certainly don't anticipate that it ever will be. But, you know, for somebody who wants to kind of maximize that kind of retired space, you know, it, the, the requirements are really, it's, it's a simple process. It's very easy to do, but they need to, as long as they're clear on you never becoming a citizen and, mm -hmm. you know, if they kind of look at the options and go, you know, when they first launched, it was very heavily focused on property development. And also it, it kind of drove crazy numbers um, in terms of the value of the properties weren't necessarily those kind of things. But now they've shifted and they're not, then you're not having to make those massive capital investments you can just spend your retirement income in there it's got to come into your bank account in Mauritius every month to qualify for residency but it's not citizenship okay so I mean not too onerous then because you know you're, you're at the moment they, you know they, they really I must say I take my hat off to them in terms of really cutting through the red tape in terms of being uh, becoming an attractive um, destination for all kinds of units they also gone after kind of the remote worker, digital nomad, you know, and they just they just need to get people in their country spending their money. Um, and they've been very clear on focused on that. So for um, you know, for people who are looking for an easy lifestyle kind of change, it's a great option um, compared to you know these very intensive kind of applications that take years and are very complicated and you've got to prove you know, everything, including where your dog was born. Um, it's it's easy, simple, and, you know, for people who are looking, not necessarily for always plan, but it's a great lifestyle choice. And if you're thinking of, you know, retired people who would like to just experience life somewhere else, it's a good choice. Sounds amazing. Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll definitely come to you to, to help me, Natalie, when the time comes. We are out of time. Um, thank you so much. I think my main takeaway from this is definitely this is not somewhere where you want to wing it on your own. Um, get an expert, get an agent that goes both for the financial side and the practical side. Um, and Natalie, it's been fascinating. Um, I, I, 
I've gotten a lot of value from it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much to everybody for joining us. And thank you, Natalie, for sharing with us. Well, thank you for having me. I've thoroughly enjoyed our chat. Innate is a registered trademark of Stanlib Wealth Management Pty Limited, an authorized financial services provider.